a uh, vernal pool expert. Now, I have to say that I do not have any degrees in ecology or botany or any of those other things. When I went to school, um, the only real jobs available for botanists was in academia or regulatory agencies. Um, however, I'm self-taught, and in the last 35 years, I've been working on various and sundry projects all over California, most of which involve vernal pools. So tonight I'm going to do um, a little bit of a whirlwind tour um, on the distribution and ecology of vernal pools. Um, and because this is a plant group, I sort of intend to spend a little more time on the animals than the plants, but I think you'll enjoy it and you'll learn something. So um, welcome to my slideshow. Um, the slide on the screen right now happens to be a vernal pool in um, just about the center of Solano County. And this is a mid-spring vernal pool in Phoenix Park in the city of Orangevale in Sacramento County. Um, and so as we go through this talk, I hope to cover um, some physical attributes, including conservation, um, but also where you see vernal pools, um, a, a definition of vernal pools, how many are left, a bunch of other stuff like that. And then I will get into the biology of the vernal pools. So there's um, a couple of important factors that play into vernal pools in California. Number one is the Mediterranean climate. Number two, you end up with depression usually in grassland, and the soils have an impermeable layer um, situated very shallowly in the soil that prevents rainwater from percolating downward into the aquifer. Um, so um, that those are the major conditions that give rise to a vernal pool. And when you're out on the landscape like this picture, um, when you encounter a vernal pool, it often appears singular and isolated. But if you go up in a small airplane, you can see that um, there are often con very complex aggregations of pools interconnected by swales and things like that. This uh, photo happens to be just east of UC Merced. So here is a hokey cartoon diagram of what I was talking about. And what I want to draw your attention to is this impervious layer right here. Um, in a lot of locations, it's hard pan. It can be other types of material, and I'll explain that. But the big deal is, is the rainwater comes down. It can't go through this impervious hard pan. So it perches above the hard pan. And where you have depressions in the landscape is where you see vernal pools. But the water is there throughout the landscape because it can't per percolate downward. So this is a stream cut in eastern Sacramento County. And it can you can see the top of the hard pan right in here. And this happens to be a hard pan that is a combination of cobbles, silica, and iron. And it cements together and keeps the rainwater from percolating down. And, you know, my first thought when I see this picture is, oh, that stream is cutting through the hard pan. Not really. The hard pan in this part of Sacramento County is about 30 feet thick. So it's going to take a very, very long time before the stream actually breaches the hard pan. So there's a lot of different geology and soil types in California, but for the purposes of this talk, um, vernal pool landscapes can be lumped into, well, we're not talking about San Diego. So the Central Valley vernal pools can be lumped into three um, primary geomorphic units. Um, the first, and this is a photograph of a pool on this, is, is high terrace vernal pools. 
Um, these are actually sitting on the alluvium that washed away from the ancient Sierra Nevada prior to the most recent uplift of the Sierra Nevada. Um, there's a huge amount of diversity of geology formations and soil types and everything else. Um, these are the pools that occur along the eastern part of the Sacramento Valley. They're most um, they're the most common ones still remaining, primarily because most of them are in cattle ranches. Um, and they're uh, more floristically diverse than a lot of the other vernal pool landscapes. So this picture happens to be, I'm sure it's at Mather Field, given the, the uh, dome in the background. And another high terrace vernal pool in, Easter, in eastern Sacramento County. Um, these high terrace vernal pools are in excess of 200,000 plus years old. Um, and the impervious water restricting layer in these pools are cemented together and it's a hard pan. The youngest of the Great Valley Vernal Pools sits in volcanic um, formations. Can everyone see the cinder cone in the black in the background? That one is Black Butte. Here, solidified volcanic mud flow forms the impervial, impermeable layer. Um, this happens to be Inks Creek Ranch um, in Tehama County. Um, and as you can see, the foreground is upland, but all of this vast, vast area in the background is actually vernal pool plants. The water just perches there and um, eventually evaporates. Um, another shot in Easter or in Tehama County, um, this happens to be Hog Lake, which is on the edge of Highway 32 in um, Tehama County, and you can see Mount Lassen in the background. Again, large expanse of vernal pool flora here in front of you. And then intermediary in age, um, there's a group of vernal pool um, areas that are on the basin rim formation. And the, the basin rim is essentially just above the 100-year floodplain of all of the major rivers in, Sacram in the Central Valley. Um, these are some of the most unique vernal pools in California. They're also the most threatened. Um, the vast majority of what would have been basin rim formation vernal pools in California has been um, converted to agriculture, primarily rice and alfalfa. Here, the, the impermeable layer is a thick clay, and that thick clay um, makes the pool slightly to moderately alkaline, and so um, that actually influences both the aquatic community and the plant community that occur in these vernal pools. So um, this is at a place called Glide Tule Ranch in Yolo County, and it's phenomenal. So I actually, this is a, a 2012 distribution of vernal pool habitat in the Great Valley. I actually have a 2018 revised map Unfortunately, um, I don't use ArtView often enough to remember how I made this map. So you're going to have to just see the 2012 distribution. So um, there's about three quarters of a million acres of vernal pool landscape remains in California. As I said before, the vast majority of the basin rim has been completely destroyed. Um, due to agriculture, there's probably less than three or four percent of what was originally in the Central Valley. Um, the volcanics are probably one of the more protected areas, um, primarily because those lands aren't good for agriculture at all. And then um, the high terrace vernal pools are just getting fragmented a lot. So here's the high terrace vernal pools go up this way. 
And then you have the volcanic vertical pools up in here. And then you have basin and basin brim here and down in here and down in there. And just for reference, let's see, UC Merced is right there. Um, Mather Field in Sacramento County, for anyone who's ever been there, is right there. And um, all of the Nature Conservancy lands up in eastern Tegema County are up in here. So as I stated before, a lot of the vernal pools in the Central Valley proper are gone. And those that remain are incredibly small remnants completely surrounded by agricultural fields. This happens to be Yolo grasslands in Yolo County. And this is a very, very old aerial photograph of Mather Field in Sacramento County. Um, and I'm showing you this because um, it was an EPA report that came out, I don't know, 10 years or so ago that said, um, that of the 4 million acres of vernal pool landscape that um, they projected originally occurred in, in the Central Valley of California, um, less than 25% remained. And almost all of the remaining areas had been disturbed by human activity. So here we have the really black little things in here, vernal pools. Here we have a housing development. Um, a runway, um, industrial stuff, golf course, settling ponds, and aggregate mining. And that becomes very apparent when you look at it more obliquely. Um, there are still some absolutely beautiful vernal pools out at Mather Field, but they're highly disturbed and fragmented. Um, the, the main Thing you see in the center there is um, a uh, sewer line, and then there's various and sundry um, trenched in and buried um, cables, a bunch of other things like that. So um, the EPA report on how fragmented and disturbed the vernal pools are is, is valuable information. But then going back to the 2012 mapping, um, at the same time that Bob Holland and I were working on this map, um, some new geo database information came out on um, federally owned, state owned and protected lands in California. And so we intersected the remaining vernal pool habitat with these protected lands. And what you get is these purple areas are protected vernal pool landscapes um, within the Central Valley. And it just so happens that um, 230,000 acres of vernal pool habitat are under some form of protection in the Central Valley. So that's about 30% of the total that still remains are protected. The unfortunate thing is, while the, they are all protected from conversion or development, um, not all of them are being managed for vernal pool resources. For instance, down here in Casterson, San Luis Wildlife Refuge area, they're actually being managed for bird habitat, and they don't pay much attention to trying to manage for the vernal pool habitat. So I've given you some ideas about um, where they are and how many are left and sort of what conditions give rise to the vernal pools. And I failed to remind everyone that vernal pools only have standing water for a very short period of time and they're dry most of the year, especially the small ones. And that's an important ecological consideration as we start to move forward in this talk. Um, essentially, fish can't live in vernal pools. So that frees up these aquatic systems from some of the worst of the predators. So I'm gonna talk about some biological attributes now. Um, we're gonna try and um, talk about why they're biologically unique, 
whether or not they're all the same and whether or not there are any extra special ones out there. The only way I know how to do this is to walk us through the season. So um, this is a vernal pool grassland in the foreground in the summer. And it's dead dry grass. And um, those are the Tuscan buttes in the background. So this has to be in Tehama County. So even standing in the middle of a vernal pool in the summertime, there is nothing but dead dry grass. And it's very, very underwhelming. And so um, given that a lot of vernal pools are in this condition for six months or longer, most people don't recognize vernal pool landscapes. Then you start moving into the fall and after you have a number of storms that essentially fills up all that space above the impermeable layer, you start to get expressions of vernal pools on the landscape. You can see puddles. Sometimes the puddles are really, really big and they attract a lot of wildlife, including a lot of wading birds. They also attract the lonely biologist. And the fifth grade students that go through the Sacramento's, um, Sacramento Splash Program. So what are all these organisms doing at the vernal pool? Why are they there? Well, one of the first things you might encounter when you're looking at a vernal pool is this egg mass of a Pacific chorus frog. Um, Pacific chorus frogs aren't endemic to vernal pools. They occur in a lot of other wetland habitats, but vernal pools are good habitat for um, these, these cute little um, frogs because there's no fish to eat their larvae. So they, they have less competition from large predators um, when they um, breed in vernal pools. So this is a microscopic water flea surrounded by a bunch of diatoms. And I'm, this is the only microscopic photo I'm gonna show you. Um, the important part of showing this is to remind everyone that it's, it's a complete ecosystem with, with uh, an amazing food chain. And the food chain always starts with microscopic organisms before you can move up to the macroscopic folks. So here we have um, California clam shrimp or Cyzicus californicus. Um, it's got this beautiful bivalve um, uh, assemblage, including little ridges on its outer shell and everything else, but it's not a bivalve. It's a shrimp. These guys get about the size of a dime and they have a combination of 14 pair of legs and antenna that they locomote themselves around in. And it is basically a closed ecosystem. Here we have um, a Hydrochora beetle larvae has got his, <clears throat> excuse me, has got his um, hypodermic like mandibles um, shoved into the water boatman. And what he does is secretes in, um, digestive enzymes into the water boatman and then sucks out bug juice. And then there's two organisms in this particular slide that are sort of fascinating, one of which is common and the other one is not quite so common, but is also highly controversial. So. You have these little red jobbers and the little red jobbers are copepods and there are hundreds of thousands of species of copepods in three different orders in the world and the vast majority of those are in marine or saltwater conditions. Vernal pools has their own complete suite of um, vernal pool copepods and then in the center here you have a fairy shrimp. And those are highly controversial because fairy sh some of the fairy shrimp in California are listed as endangered. 
So here we have a female Lindariella californica or California fairy shrimp. Um, you can tell she's a Lindariella because of her red eye and her red tail. You can tell she's a female because she's got this great looking ovisac that's just full of cysts. And the cyst looks something like um, the inset there. This isn't the cyst of this species, but it's the only one I could find. So the interesting thing, I'm not calling these eggs for a reason. Um, when I think of an egg, even a fertilized egg, I think of a chicken egg. And that fertilized chicken egg is going to require nurturing for approximately three weeks before the organism is developed enough to break out of the shell and start fending for itself. Um, this does not occur with fairy shrimp. Their habitat is so ephemeral, so short-lived, that they have come up with a completely different reproductive strategy. That cyst contains approximately 4,000 undifferentiated cells. And the minute conditions are right, those, um, those cells organize themselves into, um, a, it, they're called noplii, but essentially a baby fairy shrimp. And they just crack out of the shell, start swimming around, start feeding and growing up. Some of fairy shrimp um, can go from egg to sexually mature adult in as short as four days. So this is a, an image, it's a really badly focused image, but this is an image of um, fairy shrimp cysts, those little deflated basketball looking things in the photograph are the cysts and they completely desiccated and they're just waiting for the right um, water, you know, amount of inundation, temperature, everything else before they hatch out as fairy shrimp. But I have to slide in here because I want to talk a little bit about the coating that the female fairy shrimp puts on these cysts. The coating here is essentially indestructible. Um, it's better than any polymer known to man. Um, you can boil them, bring them back to room temperature and hatch out fairy shrimp. You can submerge them in liquid nitrogen, bring them back to room temperature and hatch out fairy shrimp. They go through the digestive system of ducks and geese and other wading birds. And you, there's a docent with the Jepson Prairie program who's a high school teacher and they go out and collect duck poop and they hatch out fairy shrimp. These have even been taken up in the space shuttle and exposed to the vacuum of space, brought back to Earth and hatched out fairy shrimp. So I mentioned before that um, some vernal pool fairy shrimp are listed. The Lindaria I just showed you is not. There's 27 species of vernal pool of fairy shrimp that occur in vernal pools in California. Um, six of those are listed. So here's just a little whirlwind tour through some of those. This happens to be um, a vernal, uh, its common name is vernal pool fairy shrimp. This is Braconecta lynchi, and it's a male. And you can tell it's a male because of these long, ornate claspers and no brood pouch. This is probably one of the more common of the listed species. It's listed as threatened. Slightly different um, arrangement of claspers, I hope you guys can see. Um, this is um, the Conservancy Fairy Shrimp or Braconecta conservatio, again, a male. Um, and this is a very highly staged photograph because um, the water that Conservancy Fairy Shrimps occurs in is so turbid that um, you would think it resembled a latte. So he had to be captured and put in fresh water so we could photograph him. 
um, another um, listed fairy shrimp um, that occurs closer to your area than my area is uh, Raconecta longi antenna. And I don't know if you can see, but this male's antennas are almost as long as his body. Um, this occurs um, in some really unusual um, cavern type um, wetlands um, in Contra Costa County, primarily. Another one of the listed fairy shrimp um, that you can encounter um, if you go down to Southern California is uh, Streptocephalus wootenai or the riverside fairy shrimp. And this guy has got really, really bright red tails too. And you'd think that they would be more susceptible to predators with those bright red tails until you realize that um, the riverside fairy shrimp also occurs in really turbid pools that you cannot see. Um, you can't see th through the water. And then the last of my um, um, listed vernal pool organisms I wanted to talk about today is the vernal pool tadpole shrimp or Lepidurus packardi. Um, this guy has not evolved since Devonium times. Um, it's a very, very strange creature um, that filter feeds. It's an omnivore. It will eat anything. It will even eat other endangered fairy shrimp. But it sort of brings me back to my question of um, what are all those things, what are all those people and animals doing at the vernal pools when there's water in them? Well, aside from the fact that it's listed as endangered and it looks a little too crunchy to me, um, that's an incredible piece of protein. And so waterfowl in particular are going to go after these um, um, on their flight paths because it provides sustenance. There's also evidence in Eastern Merced County that Native Americans harvested fairy shrimp and ate them. And when you think about um, the amount of time and effort it takes to convert, say, an acorn into something edible versus taking your winnowing basket and coming up with a cup of fairy shrimp, um, that you don't have to do anything to in order to get the protein out of it. I can see that that the Native Americans probably had a great feast out um, on the vernal pool grassland at certain times of the year. And then one other vernal pool endemic that I want to just mention here um, is the California tiger salamander. Um, this is, uh, this is Molly. Molly belongs to the Sacramento Splash Program. They have a special permit to have this endangered species there. Molly is fatter than any California tiger salamander I've ever seen before, um, because the fifth graders get to feed her. But, um, this is the larva of the California tiger salamander. They're large. They have these incredible external gills that you can just barely see in this photo. Um, this one is very close to metamorphosis. Um, you can see it, it has legs and stuff like that. These are really slow and really dumb. And it takes about 100 to 120 days for them to go from egg to something that can literally walk out of the vernal pool. And they don't survive at all in areas where there are fish. So in some parts of the Central Valley, particularly um, with uh, um, landowners who are interested, um, we've started getting them to drain their stock ponds every other year in order to kill off the bullfrog populations to keep them from being too much of a predator on the tiger salamander larva. So the aquatic phase is starting to end. Um, there's a few little rain clouds, but not enough to keep the pools full. The temperatures are warming up. 
Um, the, the water is beginning to recede. The grasslands are all greened up. And so every area um, in California has sort of their own unique vernal pool. So this is Jefferson Prairie Preserve. There's a beautiful meadow foam pool somewhere in the Central Valley. Um, again, this is somewhere near Jefferson Prairie Preserve. But you can see multiple different kinds of expression of plant communities in these vernal pools. This one happens to be in Eastern Merced County. And if they'd gotten their way, the University of California would have been right there. And it's not. And we'll talk about that a little more later. So just gorgeous expression of, of um, vernal pool um, patterns of plants for you. Now I want to get into a little more um, close up stuff. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the unique and endemic flora. There are over 200 plants um, that have been recorded in vernal pools in California. Over half of those are probably entirely endemic to vernal pools in California. The other half tends to be sort of wetland weedy stuff. Um, there are plants that are common throughout the vernal pool landscapes in California. And then there are plants that are locally and globally rare. Um, the vast majority of the species that occur in vernal pools are annuals. And so their entire goal in life is to make pretty flowers, to attract a pollinator, to get pollinated, to set seed and die. So in 1869, when um, John Muir made his second trip to Yosemite, he decided to walk instead of taking a coach like he normally would. And he wrote in his journal, and I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit, but he wrote in his journal, sauntering in any direction, my feet would brush about 100 flowers with every step as if I were wading in liquid gold. He also called them happy yellow-faced flowers and documented that there were few grasses amongst the flowers. Well, some of the species he may have been talking about are on the slide in front of you. This happens to not actually be in a vernal pool, but immediately adjacent to a vernal pool in the grasslands. And you have um, tidy tips. This happens to be Leia fremontii. You have California gold fields. Lastenia californica, and butter and eggs else clover. Um, I think it's still in the genus Trifocera, Ariantha. Most of the genera that I, I talked about how old the vernal pool landscape was, and I talked about how old some of the organisms that occur in the aquatic ecosystem are. What I didn't talk about yet is that the vast majority of the plants that occur in vernal pools are actually of fairly recent origin. Um, in fact, they're probably um, evolving as we speak. So this, um, this happens to be a meadow foam. It's in the genus Limnanthes. Um, there's an entire group of limnanthes in California that occur in vernal pools. And it, which limnanthes you get depends very often on what kind of surface and soil you're in. So the coolest thing about limnanthes, though, is it makes these great big waxy seeds and um, that it's really, really long chain um, oil. Uh, straight long chain oil, very similar to the oils used to lubricate machinery. And so there are some people up in Oregon trying to figure out if they can grow metafoam commercially um, for applica industrial application. 
So it could turn out someday that um, a vernal pool plant might save the whales. A different Lasthenia or gold fields. I showed you Californica earlier. This is um, Lasthenia fremontii, which is vernal pool gold fields. Um, that gold fields is another genus that has many, many, many species in it. Some of the gold fields are upland species, but a large handful of them are vernal pool endemic species. And here we have Silocarpus brevissimus, um, whose common name is woolly marbles that I just love. Popcorn flowers. Beard style. Um, this happens to be Pogogenes zizifroides, which is very common in the Sacramento Valley. And then Douglas's beard style, um, Pogogeny douglasi. Um, this particular genus is huge, and they're all um, vernal pool endemics. The vast majority of them are actually in the San Diego area, where they call the Mesa Mints. And then here we have Navaridia. Um, this happens to be Navaridia leucocephala. Um, there is no decent common name for this plant, and so we won't even go there. And field owls clover and vernal pool monkey flower. And then moving on to the sky blues or the downingia, this entire um, genus is, is um, restricted to vernal pools in California, and I'm going to go through some of them. So this is uh, downingia polchella or fringe downingia. Downingia ornatissima or folded downingia, downingia cuspidata or two downingia, downingia bella, Hoover's downingia, downingia bicornuda, horned downingia, downingia polchella or flat face downingia. Down India and Cygnus or Cupped Down India. And finally, one of my favorite, Down India Pusilla. Um, all of the other Down Indias I showed you before are at least the size of a nickel. Um, and this one happens to be only a couple of millimeters across. And um, there are two forms of it in California. And um, there's some discussion as to whether or not they might actually be two separate species. Um, but once you squish the plant and um, glue it to a piece of cardboard and let it molder in a cabinet for 50 years, you can't tell one of these from the other one. So it may take some time before that gets resolved. So here's a critter's view of a vernal pool in full bloom. Um, and I want to mention that all of the plants I've shown you before are from vernal pools of moderate size. I mean, a little bigger than a bathtub up to, you know, a couple of lecture hall sizes or something like that. Um, but there's a different style and type of vernal pool that occurs in some landscapes. Um, this happens to be in Merced County, but there are a lot um, in other areas. And I hope everybody can see this just huge thing down here. All these other little co lightly colored and sometimes darkly colored things are vernal pools. And what happens is they all fill up. And then once they're totally full, water starts to spill downhill. And so it ends up down here in what's called a playa pool, which is the lowest point in the landscape. And it not only is really, really huge, but its soil composition is so much different because it collects all the suspended clays and things like that from the water that runs into it. So those can sometimes pond for um, six months or more um, before they dry up. They're a favorite place of breeding California tiger salamanders, but they also include some pretty interesting endemic 
Vernal pole plants. All of the ones, pretty flowers I showed you before are of fairly recent origin. The, um, the grass tribe or cutty -E is actually a very ancient origin and probably evolved while California was still, um, while the Central Valley of California was still an inland sea. And so here we have um, Neostaphia colusana or colusa grass. This is federally listed as endangered. Sacramento or cut grass or Orcadia visita. And um, Solana grass, Tactoria mucronata. I heard a rumor over the last week that this is getting a new genus name, but I'll wait until they publish it before I mention it. So these particular grasses are all federally listed. All of them are state listed, and they only occur in those great big playa kind of pools in California. So I want to talk a little bit here because I think it's sort of important for people to understand that there are laws that... Um, there are laws. They don't protect vernal pools. They regulate their destruction. So even though there are four laws that supposedly look at um, important plant communities and important animal communities and endangered species and everything else, all they do is regulate destruction. Um, they do not prevent destruction of vernal pools. So this is a shot of Jepson Prairie, and I want to show you, there's the vernal pool right there. Well, all of the laws only really cover that little wetted area and doesn't, don't cover all of the grassland that you can see in the foreground. Um, and as a matter of fact, a lot of developers will call these non-native annual grasslands and say there is no um, purpose or reason to protect them or to mitigate for them. Um, at Jepson Prairie, you can see all of the beautiful stipopulchra that's growing in this grassland, which is fairly uncommon in the Central Valley of California. But there are other grassland species. Um, Thysanocarpus radicans or spoke pod. Um, miniature lupin. Um, um, Mimulus, I think it's still Mimulus, who knows? Um, <laughs> Mimulus, um, I've forgotten the species name. Oh, well. Um, purple Navaridia, Navaridia pubescens. Um, Blowwives, Acarachina mollis. Narrow leaved mule's ears, um, Waithia angustifolia. Cluster lily, um, Dicolostema multiflorum, um, crown brodea, brodea coronaria, and um, Calicortus luteus, gold nuggets, or yellow mariposa tulip. So those are all grassland species that don't that don't get any protection because they occur in the grasslands. And yet um, those grasslands surrounding the vernal pools are the last refugia of these species. And these species can't live in parking lots. So I really briefly wanna go back to this whole idea about laws. Um, while the environmental protection laws don't prevent destruction, of resources, they can be used to make projects less than, less impactful on those resources. And one prime example is that this is the University of California Merced campus, and they are not up in these vernal pools that you can see here. They destroyed some, but not a lot, and they aren't up on top of the hill where they really wanted to be. And then um, this happens to be uh, at Grassland State Park in Merced County. If you've never been there, it's phenomenal. They have all of these huge, huge, beautiful playa pools that if you hit it on the right weekend, they're just shocking. 
we, uh, we were doing a study on vernal pool vegetation. And this is only a picture of part of the pool, but you see all these purple flowers down in here that's down in polchella or flat face down in And at the end of the day, after collecting data from this pool, we sat down um, over cold beverages and calculated that this pool had 25 million down in blossoms blooming in it all at one time. So I hope you learned something new about vernal pools tonight. And I'm more than happy to take questions. Wow. Thank Mind you. blown. <laughs> Beautiful. That, that was really stunning. Amazing. In, in many ways. And I, and I, I kept almost on time. <laughs> uh, we great. were, I could have watched quite a bit more of those uh, photographs of the grasses and, and wildflowers were really stunning. And the fairy strip. <laughs> yeah. <amazing. laughs> no idea about it. I knew about California fairy shrimp, but I didn't, totally didn't realize the diversity. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a remarkable, I, I fell in love with them back in the eighties and it's been what I've studied for a very long time. Um, I bet there's a whole bunch of stuff in the chat that we might want to. Yeah, there is. Um, one of the, if a good question from Darren, is, uh, is it possible to restore a vernal pool ecosystem? Um, if you're talking about ecosystem, the answer is no. If you're talking about, can you make something that mimics a vernal pool that might support one of the endangered species? The answer is yes. Um, I'm looking, I'm reviewing a, a um, proof print of a paper that just came in my e inbox today that did an extensive study on the aquatic organisms between natural vernal pools and created, restored, whatever you want to call them, vernal pools, showing that they do not reproduce mm. the ecosystem. And I've been saying that for years. So, right. Yeah, it seems pretty fragile, the, the structure. Well, not only like that, they're so old and they've been in place for a long time and they have certain water chemistry and soil chemistry and yeah. Right. Hmm. Cool. And, and um, Carolyn uh, was, Jones was asking, can we talk about some good management strategies? Um, I know you, you did get into that. She asked that earlier on, but uh, Anything more you can expound on? Yeah, um, there's a reason why the vast majority of vernal pools are still in cattle ranching family. And that's because cattle ranching and vernal pools are compatible. And the minute you take um, uh, the grazing pressure off of the upland grasses, they start to invade the vernal pools and the vernal pools literally disappear. And so there's lots of, management that can be done, but the most important management is if it looks really good right now, keep the management the same. So if there are cows wandering through the landscape, keep the cows there, don't take them away. Right. In fact, someone did indeed ask about that. So um, let's see. Um, and then you also uh, mentioned the bullfrog issue and the uh, right, which is an invasive species here. The bullfrog. Uh, yeah, uh, bullfrogs are an invasive species, but um, a good good cattle rancher who's really interested in his habitat and and stuff like that more than just trying to you know feed cows. I know a lot of ranchers who do grass fed, grass finished beef. And they really care about their land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're always listening to biologists who say, this could be an issue. You can address it this way or you can address it that way. And then they go off and very often do it, like draining their stock ponds so the bullfrogs go away. Mm -hmm. Nice. 
So uh, Jennifer uh, asked, she had went on an excursion to the wind caves near Mount Diablo and um, they were shown pools that were supposedly vernal pools, but they're not on your map. So do you know anything about those? Yeah, I do know about those. I've been to those. Do you know it is, okay, so the map is done completely from interpretation of aerial photography. And mm -hmm. when you get into those rock pools that uh, there's, there's nothing you can see on the aerial photograph that tells you they're there. Right. So that is part of the reason they have not been included in that, um, in that overall map. However, I can tell you that chances are really high that there's um, a Brackenect Alonghi antenna in those pools because that's the kind of pools that that particular fairy shrimp likes. Um, Isabel asked, who wrote the article that you were um, talking about with the aquatic organisms and natural versus created? Um, hang on, I might be able to. Okay, I can't open it at the moment because I don't know. Um, Sean, and I can't think of his last name, he worked with Brent Helm and Jamie Nightall and a whole bunch of other things. I think this is his, his thesis work. And I just got a copy of the proof today that I'm reading. And so it won't be out for a month or two. Well, I think that's probably all we've got time for. And I, I so appreciate your time. That was uh, more beautiful than I imagined even. I've been to them, but now our curiosity is highly picked. <laughs> Right. So um, Jepson Prairie Preserve, starting the second weekend in March, every Saturday and Sunday at 10 a.m., an incredible docent crew that will show you the animals in the water and take you around to look at flowers and everything else. For the Bay Area, that's your closest, best shot at getting to see the vernal pools. Okay, well, thanks again, and uh, really you. appreciate you being here, and appreciate all you all out there. You're uh, spending some of your evening with us in this way, and hope to hope you all have a beautiful holiday season, however you celebrate it. Thank you all. See you next month.